All right, everyone, I'm going to get started as soon as I see some people start viewing this. For those of you watching this as a recording, today we're going to start talking about, uh, we're going to pick up where we left off last time. Um, we didn't get to bacteria, viruses, and the immune system, so I'm going to go through that first. And then I'm going to be going through the um, kind of the order of the rest of the semester where we went through some ecology stuff. We talked about uh, population ecology and community ecology and some general ecology terms. So I'll be going over that. Um, I'm going to skip the animal unit and do that last because there's not, not going to be that much stuff on the final exam on that animal unit. Um, but I will talk about what will be covered on that. And then I will, I will also go over um, our plant unit we just finished off. Um, and we didn't have a test on this, so I'll go over the plants as well. So that's going to be kind of our, our outline for today. If you have any questions, feel free to use the Q&A uh, part of the screen. Um, again, those questions will be on delay, so if I don't get to them right away, I apologize. I'll get to them as soon as I can. I'll also be checking the documents that I pushed out through Classroom on each unit. If you have questions on there, um, I'll make sure I try to cover those. If not during the presentation, during the Prezi presentation, I'll cover them definitely at the end. This might go over an hour um, because we do have a lot to cover, so I'll, I've scheduled it till 9.30. I'll try to go as fast as I can, um, but still kind of cover everything that needs to be covered before the final. Um, so I can see I have uh, eight viewers in now, so if one of you can maybe test out the question and answer part, that would be helpful for me to know that that's working and to let me know that you can hear me and that you can see me. Um, so someone could test that out, that'd be great. For those of you who want to follow along, I, I have posted the Prezi that I'm using uh, to Google Classroom. It should be shared by a link there, so you can always go back and look at that Prezi if you would like. Um, all the Prezi, a lot of the slides from that Prezi have been coming from, uh, in, again, a, a really awesome AP Biology teacher from New York, uh, David Konufke. Um, so you can want to check out his Prezi's. I have a link on my website to those. Um, I stole a bunch of his stuff and kind of using it for tonight's review session. All right, so it looks like a lot of people are saying that they can hear me, which is great. Thank you guys for chiming in. Looks like I have 13 viewers, so we're gonna go ahead and get started. I'm going to share my screen with you now. I will show you the Prezi that I am working off of. Hold on a second. There we go, entire screen. All right, and we should be off and running here. Cool, very cool. All right, so we're gonna start with uh, bacteria and viruses and the immune system. So I'm gonna skip over, um, well actually we're gonna kinda go back to something that didn't cover any in evolution, that was our general Characteristics of kingdoms. I believe uh, someone had a question on that. Yesterday, or sorry, Saturday. All right, this Prezi is kind of lagging a little bit. So, um, so Eukarya. Um, basically, the the seven kingdoms that we've talked about um, are really broken down into two major domains, uh, or actually three major domains. We have eukarya, which is, consists of four kingdoms. We'll talk about those, and then we'll get into our bacteria um, kingdoms in a little bit. Um, but basically, in uh, kingdom eukarya, we have the animals, and the animals, again, are going to be multicellular organisms that are heterotrophic, which means they must get food from an outside source. Uh, the major thing about animals is that they are internal digesting organisms, if not inter in their cells, um, they're definitely internal. They have some kind of gut or cavity for digestion. We'll talk about that more in the animal unit. Um, then we have the fungi, which are your um, also heterotrophic organisms. Most of them are multicellular, though some of them are unicellular, like um, molds and uh, yeast cells um, are unicellular organisms, but they are heterotrophic as well, but they're different than animals in that they are external digesting organisms. They secrete enzymes into their, into their environment for digestion and then absorb the nutrients. So we are internal digesting organisms, whereas fungi are external digesting. And then we move on to the plants. The plants are multicellular organisms. They are autotrophic, at least most of them are. Some are saprobes where they 
um, kind of feed off of other organisms, um, kind of like a parasite. But most are photosynthetic organisms. They use sunlight as their energy source, uh, multicellular organisms, and um, are a big important part of ecology, which we'll talk about in a little bit. And then we have the protus, which is the kingdom I often call kingdom miscellaneous, or because this kingdom is not going to be around very long. We didn't really cover it this year, so it won't really be covered on the final um, because this kingdom is very wacky and basically is not going to exist for the next couple of years. So moving on um, to our disease unit, we, I'm going to start off with viruses uh, before I get to bacteria. Um, so basically a virus, we defined it as an obligate intracellular parasite. Basically all a virus is is a some genetic information that's surrounded by a protein coat. Um, that's what our virus, and I, I like uh, this quote Mr. Konofsky put in his Prezi on uh, Sir Peter Edouard, basically a virologist said, um, all it is is a piece of bad news wrapped in a protein, which is you know kind of what viruses do. All they really do um, is infect cells. So um, since they do not carry out life cycles um, independent of a host cell, we typically do not consider viruses to be living organism. But again, it doesn't really matter for what we're talking about. They do cause infection, they do affect us, and so we did, we talked about them, we're gonna learn about them. Um, the first virus was discovered by Dmitry Abanovsky, who was studying transmission of tobacco mosaic disease, um, basically figuring out that this disease was caused by something smaller than a bacteria that it couldn't be seen. Um, and since then, we've discovered that basically viruses are these particles that cause um, disease in almost all organisms. You know, for every organism, every kind of living thing there is on this planet, there is a virus that is going to be able to infect it. Um, so since then, viruses you know, for all domains have been found. Uh, many are harmless though, um, but some are quite deadly. Uh, we've talked about several different kinds of viruses. As far as the what I need you to know about what viral diseases are, um, I just want you to know that like things like herpes, measles, polio, smallpox, influenza um, are, are caused by viruses. What the symptoms are, I'm not that concerned with. It's really just that these are viral diseases um, because we know that viruses cannot be treated with antibiotics. That's just an important thing for you guys to know. Um, there's basically two kinds of viruses we talked about. We talked about prokaryotic viruses a lot. These are viruses that um, infect only bacteria. We call them bacterial phages. Um, and there are two kind of life cycles we discovered or we discussed in this unit. We talked about a virulent phage, which goes by what's called the lytic cycle. Um, this is the viral cycle that we typically think of um, when we think of how a virus works. Basically, the virus attaches to the organism. Um, in this case, it's a bacteria cell. It gets its DNA inside that bacteria cell somehow. That DNA um, basically tells the bacteria to start making more virus parts. So viral genomes and viral proteins, those viral parts assemble into new viruses, and then the virus busts out of the bacteria, killing the bacteria, and goes on to infect bacteria nearby. Um, that's a classic lytic cycle type of infection. Um, and then the other type of infection we talked about was a temperate phage, or the lysogenic cycle, where you have kind of both lytic and so active infection and this kind of resting phase uh, where the virus actually incorporates its DNA or I should say the DNA of the virus incorporates itself into the bacterial chromosome, which then replicates every time the bacteria replicates. Um, and then this type of virus can kind of switch back and forth. It can go from the lysogenic, where it's kind of dormant, and then it can switch on and then go lytic and spread as viral particles. So um, temperate phages do both types of cycles. Um, and we definitely need to know the difference between those two types of cycles. And then we had the eukaryotic viruses, which are very similar. Um, one reason we study prokaryotic viruses in the first place is that no one really cares if we kill a bunch of bacteria cells in the lab. And two, bacteria re replicate very quickly, and they're very easy to study. Eukaryotic viruses are a little bit difficult, more difficult to study because you need eukaryotic cells to study them on, a little bit harder to grow eukaryotic cells in the lab and to actually find patients willing to, you know, take part in viral trials um, is not that um, not that prevalent. So eukaryotic viruses um, are the most diverse of all phages. Basically, we talked about different ways of classifying them. The main way to classify them is either the type of genetic material they have. They are either DNA or RNA viruses, and those genomes can be single or double-stranded. 
Um, many of these viruses have that lipid envelope that surrounds them. It's that protein or that lipid layer that they get from the cells they infect um, that helps them actually get into eukaryotic cells. So DNA viruses and RNA viruses work very differently in how they actually cause infection. Basically, the main difference is that a DNA virus, once its DNA gets inside the cell, so the picture here on the left, once the DNA gets inside the cell, it can be transcribed and translated. So transcribed means it will go from DNA to RNA. That RNA is used by the cell to make viral proteins. Those viral proteins form the viral capsids. The, the cell also starts replicating that viral DNA, and that DNA gets incorporated inside the capsid, and the virus emerges from the cell. The main way RNA viruses are different than this is that we don't have that transcription part. Um, the viral genome, which is usually RNA or um, an RNA virus, it can be used directly as the mRNA template and the genome copy. So you don't have to go through that, sec that, that transcription step. Um, the RNA already is ready to be read to make proteins. The, the, the cell makes proteins, makes those viral capsid proteins, and makes copies of the genome, and those get incorporated together, and you get new viruses budding from the cell. So that's the main difference between the two types of viruses, DNA viruses and RNA viruses. We didn't get into the difference between double-stranded and single-stranded, and there are all different kinds of these types of viruses. Again, we're not going to have you guys know you know, is herpes a double-stranded DNA virus or not? Um, but just to know that we do classify viruses based on their genome, and is it DNA or RNA, or um, is it double-stranded or single-stranded, because that really tells us how viruses infect the cells that they infect. Um, two main examples that we talked about in class, though, were or, or diseases were influenza, which is an RNA virus. Um, we watched a short video clip of the 1918 flu epidemic, which caused a, a lot of deaths. Um, and as far as I want to let you know is that this is just caused by a virus um, and we can't take antibiotics for this. We need to find better antiviral drugs and so forth um, to because this type of disease could come back. Um, it's pretty scary that this type of disease is still out there. And then we also talked about human immunodeficiency virus, or HIV, and how that leads to AIDS. Um, HIV is a retrovirus. Um, it's, a, it's a unique RNA virus that basically uses an enzyme called reverse transcriptase, um, which then makes a DNA copy of the, the genome from the RNA that the virus is carrying. That DNA then becomes part of the cell's chromosome, so kind of like that lysogenic cycle we talked about earlier. Um, which is very unique. It doesn't really follow our central dogma of DNA to RNA to protein because we go backwards with that reverse transcriptase enzyme. Um, and then the, the, the real scary thing about HIV is that it goes after a specific cell that's in charge of your immune system to keep it functioning. So basically this virus doesn't kill you. What kills you is some other type of disease because your immune system has been weakened so, poorly, so, uh, so badly. All right, and we also talked about in our virus unit, we talked about some other things that weren't viruses. We focused on prions, which are disease-causing protein molecules. They have no genetic material. We talked about, um, you know, mad cow disease, cleft cell Jacobson disease. Um, these are all infectious proteins, and the really scary thing about this is that there is no cure. Um, these diseases, we can't, the only way to destroy a protein is to denature the protein. And to denature a protein, you need a really acidic environment or a really high temperature, which is not going to be good for a patient who might have a prion disease. So prions are pretty scary diseases. Fortunately, they're, they're pretty rare, especially in humans, um, though we still need to be careful about them because, you know, they're found in other organisms like cows and sheep and deer and so forth. So those are, that was the viruses. We didn't spend that much time on viruses. I'm going to check in here on my questions and see how we're doing over here. Uh, I don't see any questions showing up, so that's good. Okay, so moving on. Uh, we're going to talk about uh, bacteria now. So bacteria, um, basically in our bacteria, you know, we looked at two different domains um, based on the type of prokaryotic organism they were. We had domain bacteria or eubacteria, which was a kingdom that falls underneath that domain, and domain archaea, which we're going to talk about first. 
Um, I like that Mr. Knofsky put in here that it's a domain of weirdos. Um, basically, these were the most recently discovered kind of prokaryotic organism. Um, they were thought to be simple bacteria up until the 1990s. This is kind of when I was in high school. Uh, we, there was this major shift in biology going from kingdom being the highest level of classification to this domain. Um, we kind of talked about where these bacteria are found. Um, they live in very extreme environments that are thought to be the type of environments that were found on the early Earth. It's not like these are the older bacteria. In fact, these bacteria have more in common with us than we do with true bacteria in that other domain. Um, but the, the, the weird environments these things are found in are like you know hot springs found in Yellowstone uh, that have very acidic environments, very hot environments. You can find these in hot water heaters of people's homes. Uh, basically, they can be found in temperatures that are above boiling, which most living things can't survive. Um, they're also found in the guts of many uh, mammals um, and other places that have high methane. Um, they can convert uh, complex carb uh, hydrocarbons into methane as their energy source. These are the, the unique prokaryotic organisms that we don't have to worry too much about because they really don't infect us because our body is not well suited for them. What we do have to worry about are these bacteria. These are our eubacteria organisms. They're prokaryotic unicellular organisms. Um, they vary in their nutritional modes, kind of how they get nutritional. We'll talk about that in a little bit. And um, basically, the main one of the main differences between these bacteria and the archaea bacteria is they have uh, cell walls made with peptoglycan. No, you will not have to spell that on the final, but you should recognize what that word is. So a little bit about the anatomy of a bacteria cell. Like I said, bacteria cells are made of peptoglycan, um, and there are two major ways the cell wall can be arranged. We have the gram-positive bacteria over here on the left. You can see these have a very thick layer of peptoglycan on their cell wall, which is right above their cell membrane, whereas the gram-negative bacteria have a very thin layer of peptoglycan, but this extra outer membrane of carbohydrates and um, uh, lipids basically that are that's found outside that peptoglycan layer and basically this difference in cell wall for us what the real importance is is you know how we can treat them with different antibiotics knowing what type of bacteria it is based on a cell wall can really help a doctor in determining what type of antibiotic treatment is is best um, and we use what's called a gram stain to determine this. Basically, gram positive bacteria stain purple. So you can see here there are a bunch of purple cocci bacteria, those circular spherical bacteria. And then we have a bunch of gram negative um, bacilli bacteria, those pink rod shaped bacteria over there. You should review the names uh, that we talked about in uh, for as far as shape are concerned. Um, also, outside the cell wall, we do have a capsule, very similar to a viral envelope in that it, it's. Um, it's, it's part, like, kind of like a cell membrane in a sense where it's, a, it's one for protection, but it also helps bacteria kind of disguise themselves from our immune system, which makes them a little bit more pathogenic than other bacteria cells. Um, other parts of the bacteria that we've talked about, we have, so we talked about capsule, we talked about cell wall, plasma membrane, all cells have those. They have cytoplasm inside. Uh, they don't have any organelles. Uh, Membrane-bound organelles, they do have ribosomes, so they do make their own proteins. Um, their DNA is usually found in one circular um, loop called a nucleoid, uh, but they do have these extra pieces of DNA called plasmids inside their cytoplasm that carry certain genes like antibiotic-resistant genes. We manipulate a plasmid to make our bacteria glow green. We insert a GFP gene into a plasmid, and we got the bacteria to take that up and start making that green glowing protein. Uh, bacteria also have means of locomotion through their flagellum, and they also have these structures called pili, which helps them stick to things, and especially themselves. When we talk about reproduction, they'll also make more sense. So like I said, the flagellum enables bacteria to move. Um, what's interesting about the bacteria flagellum is that it works differently than eukaryotic flagellum, like in a sperm cell. Basically, bacteria flagellum work kind of like a propeller on a plane, um, whereas a um, eukaryotic flagellum kind of thrashes back and forth like a tail or a whip, uh, which is why it is thought that this flagella evolved independently of eukaryotic flagella. Very interesting that they both have a structure that helps them move that looks similar, but they're actually evolutionarily different. Um, and then the pili also help bacteria, like I said, adhere or stick to other things, especially themselves. 
Here are the shapes. We have the spiral-shaped bacteria, which are called spirochetes or spirilia. We have the rod-shaped bacteria, which are called the bacilli. And we have the round or spherical-shaped bacteria called the... Uh, oh, where's my picture of the cocci? I think this is supposed to be cocci here, not bacillus. Sorry about that. Um, the spelling there kind of should change that. Um, anyways, bacteria can be distinguished by their shape um, and kind of how they form their colonies. We talked about Staphylococcus and Streptococcus, um, so I would recommend reviewing those terms. All right, I'm going to check in with questions. I see some questions have come up. Okay. So how does HIV being a retrovirus affect its symptoms? Um, well, the symptoms you have of HIV infection really is just the symptoms of your immune system recognizing that something is there that's not supposed to be there. Um, so that's basically, you get, a, you get flu-like symptoms uh, on the onset of HIV. Um, so what, and that doesn't kill you. Um, HIV doesn't go after your cells that are essential for, for, for life, but they go after your immune system cells, which will prevent you from, you know, um, getting over other infections. Okay, um, I just went over the name. I just went over the names of the shapes. Okay, so cocci, bacilli, and spirilia. We kind of went over those. Um, what is the what is the order of classification for organisms? Um, so we have domain, kingdom, phylum, class, order, family, genus, species. Okay, so domain, king, Philip came over for green spaghetti is how I would recommend remember that. All right. Um, peptoglycan kind of makes up the cell wall slash membrane, I think. Uh, it's the cell wall, not the cell membrane. Will we need to identify lytic and lysogenic cycles in a test? And if so, let's go ahead and do that because I forgot. So remember, lytic is the short, quick cycle because it's a short, quick word to say. And lysogenic is the longer cycle where the bacteria or the virus becomes part of the genome of the cell. Um, and it may take longer to actually cause infection. Let's see. Okay, looks like a lot of you are getting your questions answered. So, I don't know why it's doing this weird repeating thing. I didn't do that last time, so I might, might be doing something wrong this time. So I'm going to go back and let me try this. Let me share something different. Sorry about this, guys. I want to try something different. Just share this. Yeah, this looks better. Okay. All right, so on to bacterial genetics. Um, so basically the way bacteria reproduce is through a process called binary fission. Um, binary fission is the simplest form of, of reproduction where you basically copy your chromosome and then you split yourself in half. This is asexual because it does not involve two parents. It only involves one parent. So one parent re re resulting in two daughter cells, which means it could happen very quickly. You know, as quick as one bacterium can reproduce every 20 minutes, which basically you go from one to a bunch of bacteria in a short period of time. So here's binary fission. You start with one cell, one chromosome. The chromosome replicates. The cell separates through cytokinesis, and you get two new cells as a result. Simplest form of reproduction you can think of. Um, but there are other ways bacteria get information, um, genetic information between bacteria cells. It's called horizontal transfer. Basically, this is how bacteria can evolve. They can get new traits and new, um, new genetic material, um, which allows them to form genetically recombinant organisms. Um, so we have transformation. Basically, bacteria take up a plasmid from the environment. This is what we did in our PGLO lab. We basically introduced a plasmid into the bacterial environment. We heat shocked it, which caused the bacteria to take that plasmid up, and it was able to produce the proteins that were on that plasmid. So that's the simplest form of horizontal gene transfer. It's called transformation. And then we have conjugation, which basically bacteria exchange DNA through direct connection. It's not sexual reproduction because we're not producing gametes and making a new organism, but they do connect and they do exchange material. So they connect at these things called pili, um, which we talked about earlier, which again, we talked about help bacteria adhere to each other. So that adherence 
forms this mating bridge, which allows them to exchange genetic material. But again, it's not sexual reproduction because you're not, you don't have two parents and one offspring. It's just an exchange of genetic information between two living bacteria cells. Then we have transduction, which is really interesting. Bacteria acquire new DNA from a bacterial phage. So a virus introduces a new gene into the bacteria cell. So maybe the virus doesn't kill the bacteria itself, um, but the virus inserts a new gene that may help the bacteria one day. So those are all ways bacteria get new um, genetic information. So a little bit about the ecology of bacteria. Basically, um, most bacteria are pretty good. And in fact, we rely on them. We talked a lot about them in our nutrient cycles from first semester as far as the nitrogen cycle relies solely on bacteria to give us our nitrogen sources. So they're, they're the foundation of most all the ecosystems on the planet. Um, they can tolerate a range of environmental conditions. Um, and like I said earlier, they have a wide variety of nutrition. So let me zoom in on here. Oops, wrong way. So we have the photoautotrophs, which they use light as their energy source. We have the, um, so they use light as their energy source, yet they use carbon dioxide as their carbon source. So that's where they get the auto from. We have chemoautotrophs, where they use inorganic chemicals such as hydrogen sulfide or iron um, as their energy source, but still use carbon dioxide as their carbon source. So those are the autotrophic bacteria. And you have the heterotrophic bacteria, they get, their they get their carbon from organic compounds, but they can be photoheterotrophs, where they mean they use light as their energy source, but they use organic compounds as their um, carbon source. And you have your chemoheterotrophic bacteria, which use organic compounds as their energy source and as their carbon source. So those are different types of energy needs, um, nutritional modes for these bacteria cells. All right, moving on to bacteria's pathogens. Um, we've talked a lot about different types of bacterial infections. Um, again, all I ask you to do is just kind of not, you're not going to need to know all the bacterial infections that we've talked about, but basically know that a bacterial infection is treatable with antibiotics. So things like meningitis, pneumonia, certain skin infections like Staphylococcus aureus infections, E. coli infections are all treatable with antibiotics. Um, except for one they just discovered, which is not, which is kind of scary. Uh, but these differ greatly from viral infections because we can treat these with antibiotics. And those first discovered by Alexander Fleming back in 1928. He won a Nobel Prize for it. But you don't need to know that for the test at all. So I'm going to uh, go back here and see if there's any other questions. So it looks like Jack is asking about the flower. Um, I will be going over that at the very end of this presentation. So we'll cover plants at the very end. Um, and then what is pepti someone asked, what is peptoglycan? Peptoglycan is that kind of protein-lipid combination. I think it's protein and lipid that make it up. But basically it's found in the cell walls of eubacteria and are not found in archaebacteria. All right, so I think that's all for the questions. All right, so back to our immune system. So our immune system. Um, basically, we're going to start with kind of what's called our innate immunity and what's called our adaptive immunity. We didn't really use those words in the in the videos you guys made. But basically, the innate immunity is kind of like our passive immunity, like it's always working. Um, our innate immunity basically recognizes pathogens with these small little receptors on our cells, but they're, they're, they're not specific. So it's always just kind of there, sometimes referred to as the nonspecific immune system. Basically, we have the barriers, which are skin, mucous membranes, and secretions by those membranes that keep stuff out of our body. And then we have some internal defense uh, cells that eat up other foreign cells, are called phagocytic cells. And then just the inflammatory response is the one we covered in class, which just helps bring more phagocytic cells to the area and slows down the bacteria from reproducing. 
Then we have what's called our adaptive immunity or our specific immune response, which involves our B cells and T cells. We'll talk about those a little bit later, which is interesting. They're, it's only found in organisms that have a vertebrate. So vertebrates are the only organisms with a very high adaptive immune system, which is, includes us. So starting with our innate immunity, again, the nonspecific immunity. The external features we have to that would be our skin and our mucous membrane. So our skin basically is a waterproof barrier to infection. It prevents bacteria from getting in. Um, we have sweat glands that make the surface of the skin basically inhospitable to microorganisms. They don't want to live in a salty environment, so they don't live in our skin very well. Um, there are some bacteria that live there um, commensally with us, which means they, they're just there taking up space. They're not hurting us. But what's actually kind of nice about them, they just occupy space. Uh, they basically take up all the sparking spots that bad bacteria would want to take over if they had the opportunity. So these commensal bacteria are actually helpful in a sense. So maybe they're almost not commensalism, but more kind of mutualism, where they actually help us. They give us a benefit um, by preventing bad bacteria from growing there, which is often why overuse of hand sanitizer is actually not good for you because you could kill those commensal bacteria species that are supposed to be living on your skin. And then we have mucous membranes. Uh, mucus is that really sticky stuff that usually disgusts people, like when you sneeze. Um, but basically, the mucus li basically lines all parts of the body that are not covered in skin, which basically you know is our oral passage and our reproductive passages. Um, basically, it, it, it's there to trap bacteria and viruses from getting past it. And it also contains lysozymes, which are... Um, enzymes that disrupt bacteria cell walls, so if they do get trapped in the mucus, they will eventually die. Um, so we do need to get stuff into our body, like when we breathe um, and digest food, stuff has to move into our body. So we have mucous membranes lining those, those areas to prevent bad stuff from getting in. Okay, so internal, once if something does get past the... Um, the skin or the membranes, we have some cells that help out. Um, we're not going to talk about the specifics of these type of stem cells, but I do want to focus on um, these urethros, uh, these neutrophiles and um, all these cells down here. We're just going to call them phagocytes. Um, phagocytes are cells that gobble up foreign cells that aren't supposed to be there, gobble up viruses, and destroy them. Okay, they're not specific. They just basically eat up anything that they recognize as not being part of the body. So phagocytes, um, they're just white blood cells that basically are on patrol through your circulatory and your lymphatic system that are just always on the lookout for something that's not supposed to be there. Um, and they digest any material they do not recognize. Um, they use the phagocytosis, which we learned first semester, um, and they bring the cell into their body and or their cell body, and they digest it, which is important because they, they help communicate to our specific immune system that they found something that wasn't supposed to be there. Um, so they do have a connection to the next type of the immune system that we're going to get into. Um, and then we also talked about the inflammatory response where you have, um, it's, it occurs whenever a skin is ruptured. So whenever there's a break in your skin um, or if the body's infected in some way, you go through this immune response called the inflammatory response. Basically cells at the site of the infection release signals um, which basically recruit other phagocytic cells to the air. They're basically telling cells, hey, there's microorganisms or there's viruses infecting us. We need to get rid of them. But these signals increase blood flow, which is why when you have an inflammation, you usually get, um, usually turns red and swollen. Um, and that's a key indication that you might have an infection. But if you just, you know, break your skin by cutting it or, you know, you sprain your ankle or something like that, you have this inflammatory response as well because even though there might not be microorganisms infecting you, they still release those, those chemicals that cause uh, increased blood flow to that area, which causes swelling and redness and tenderness. So moving on to our adaptive or our specific immune system, um, we're going to start off with humoral, um, which basically I'm not going to worry about the word humoral, but basically this involves the B cells. Um, those B cells are what are going to produce antibodies at some point, which are specific um, proteins that latch on to foreign antigens. Basically, so a macrophage just gobbled up a bacteria or a virus, it presents itself 
or presents that protein to a helper T cell, which is the central cell in part of the immune system. That helper T cell goes and talks to the B cells and tells them, hey, this is what the virus, let's say, looks like. Um, and then the B cell starts producing these antibodies that go and attach themselves to any free virus. Um, what's also great about our immune system is that we produce these memory cells. We'll talk about the importance of them a little bit later. So those plasma cells, again, produce antibodies that just get flooded into the circulatory system on the lookout for any of those pathogens. Again, they're specific only to that pathogen. It'd be pretty bad if antibodies were not specific because they would attach themselves to anything, and that could be very well your, your healthy, normal cells, and that would not be good for your body. So it's really important that these antibodies are specifically targeted for the pathogen that your body is trying to get rid of. And then again, those memory cells kind of remember what that virus or bacteria look like, and they stick around in case you get infected again, so you can go right into antibody production and don't have to worry about those first two steps of the helper T cell having to communicate to the B cell. So moving down here, um, let's get past this. Uh, basically, I just wanted to show kind of how the antibodies work. Don't worry about these terms down here. I should have deleted those. Basically, the antibodies are these Y-shaped structures that attach to bacteria or attach to viruses and prevent them from attaching to cells. And they also target infected cells um, to be destroyed by the next part of the immune system. So antibodies are pretty multifunctional structures or proteins in your immune system. Oh, a little bit on the primary versus secondary response before we get to the next section of the immune system. Um, basically, during your primary response, you're exposed to an antigen, you start producing antibodies, and that takes a good amount of time. Um, so that's what this graph is kind of showing here. If you're exposed to that antigen again, what's great about those memory cells is that you get a massive amount of antibodies produced in a relatively short period of time to stop the infection. Um, so that's the great thing about our secondary response is basically we say we're immune to that virus because our immune system is so good at attacking it, we don't even notice that we've been infected in the first place. So those memory cells really help the body prevent infection from happening again because, again, they know what the virus looks like and they can produce the antibodies right away for that viral, uh, if that virus comes back or bacteria cell. All right, on to the cell mediated or the specific um, part, excuse me, the T cell part of the immune system. So this is our T cell mediated response. This results in the activation of a particular T cell that recognizes specific antigens and we're going after infected cells. These are called cytotoxic T cells. So again, the phagocyte will present the antigen to the helper T cell, tells the helper T cell what the antigen looks like, and the helper T cell communicates to this these specific cytotoxic T cells. Um, the cytotoxic T cells will go around and look for infected cells um, and cause apoptosis, which will trigger cell death because it's better to lose virus-producing cells than to lose all the cells in the body. So we basically kill off any cell that's producing viruses with these cytotoxic T cells. And also, these produce memory cells. So just as in the other response, we can have a more robust response if that antigen is seen again by the virus or by the body. Um, this is just kind of what, again, a lot of vocabulary here you don't really need to know, but I like the picture here where we have the T cell is going to basically activate, um, be activated by that macrophage. Um, and then the cytotoxic T cell notices that this is an infected cell. It starts recruiting certain proteins called perforin, which basically puts holes in the cell membrane and the cell basically dies, which is really important because then that cell can no longer produce more viruses. So again, the two major types of cells in our specific immune system is the B cell and the T cell. The reason why it's called the B cell is because it matures in the bone marrow. You don't really need to know that. Um, there was a T cell matures in the thymus, but that's where they get their names from. But what, what you really need to know is like what they do. Whereas the humoral response is going to be going after um, the actual pathogen that's in your body, and the cell-mediated response is going, over, going after infected cells. So you get exposed to an antigen. So this is a protein on the virus or bacteria that your cell recognizes as not belonging. Usually it gets picked up by some macrophage or phagocyte that gobbles it up and communicates to the helper T cell. The helper T cell communicates to the B cells and the cytotoxic T cells saying, hey, we're infected, let's start taking care of it. 
Those B cells turn to plasma cells, start secreting antibodies to go after the free viruses or free bacteria in the, that's going around your blood system. And the cytotoxic T cells are activated and they go against any infected cells, which is also interesting. They also go after cancer cells, which is a, one big thing about cancer research. What's great about both sides of our immune system, again, we have these memory cells that are produced. So if we get exposed a second time, the, the, the output of antibodies and the output of activated cytotoxic T cells is much higher and much faster, so we don't even feel like we got sick. But going back to HIV and AIDS, again, that virus goes after the helper T cells. So it doesn't really kill off your immune system. In fact, it basically kills off your way your immune system communicates. So you have B cells and you have T cells available. You just have no way of communicating to them because the helper T cell no longer does its job. It just starts making more HIV viruses, which is pretty bad for your body if that happens because you could die for something as simple as pneumonia. So again, both the humoral and cell-mediated immune response rely upon the action of the helper T cell, which is why diseases like HIV are so devastating. Um, together, both responses protect the organism from pathogens, infected cells, and even can help um, protect you from cancer. All right, so that was the immune system. I'll go check over and see if we have any questions. All right, so was this question was, was cancer this semester? No, that was first semester with cell division, so that will not be on the final. Don't need to worry about that. This is a really good question. What is the difference between antigens and pathogens? Is there one? Yes, there is. The pathogen is the bacteria or the virus itself, whereas the antigen is the protein. Um, usually it's a protein. It could be a carbohydrate. It could be anything on the cell surface that the body recognizes as not belonging to the body. So the antigen is actually part of the pathogen. Okay, this question, can you go over phagocytosis? Phagocytosis is just a cell bringing a, a, something inside of it and digesting it inside the cell. Okay, this question, what's the difference between humoral and cell-mediated again? Again, humoral response is basically, that's the response of your immune system going after the actual virus or bacteria that's causing the infection, whereas the cell-mediated response involves the cytotoxic T cells that are going and destroying infected cells so you don't make more viruses or bacteria. Okay, we're going to move on to ecology. I can see we're definitely probably going to go to 9.30 tonight because I can see we've only gone over one major unit, and that took us almost 45 minutes. So ecology. Basically, we broke this down into two major parts, community interactions and population interactions. So in community ecology, basically in our levels of organization, we're looking at the part of the, um, the living world where – we're looking at all populations in a single area. So all living things in that one area would be considered our community. Um, that's kind of what we're focusing on. So there's a lot of different interactions that we talked about in community ecology, so I'll be going over each one of them. Uh, the first major one is competition. Um, in competition, it's the contest between individuals for shared resources. Uh, we talked about interspecific or within um, I'm sorry, interspecific is between species, so there's interspecific competition between different species. And intraspecific competition is within the same species, so like multiple lions fighting over one gazelle is intraspecific. Lions and hyenas fighting over that, that gazelle is interspecific competition. So one of the major terms we talked about in ecology, in community ecology, was the idea of a niche, um, which basically we said is like the organism's job. Um, or how it interacts with its environment. Um, so competition limits the organism's niche. That was kind of a big topic. We talked about fundamental niche and realized niche. The fundamental niche is basically all the possible aspects of the environment that that organism can use. 
to survive and reproduce. Whereas a realized niche is what it actually gets to use. So um, we, we gave an example of these two different barnacles. Uh, we'll, I'm not going to worry about the names of them. We'll just talk about them as being the tan ones and the blue ones. So the tan barnacles have a have a real big fundamental niche. They can live at high tide. They can live at low tide. They can live completely submerged or unsubmerged in the water, they have a very big niche that they can fundamentally live in. Whereas those blue barnacles don't have as big of a fundamental niche because they can't withstand being dried out during the day. Um, so they, they live in the, the lower parts of this coastal area. But because these guys grow faster, they take up all the space, their realized niche overlaps with the fundamental niche of the tan barnacle. So the tan guys actually only get to live in this area right here because they just they're, they're, their resource is being taken by this blue barnacle down here. If left by themselves, these tan barnacles will live all over the coastline, but because these blue barnacles grow faster, um, it kind of pushes these tan barnacles out of their fundamental niche into what we then call our realized niche. So because organisms are constantly competing for, for resources, um, we have what's called competitive exclusion, where two species have overlapping niches, and one will outcompete the other. You know, so if two niches completely overlap, like in this example of these, I'm sorry, of these um, paramecia, one outcompetes the other, and the blue paramecia wins, and the tan paramecia basically goes either to extinction or to a very low population number. That's competitive exclusion. Basically, one outcompetes the other. We also then have resource partitioning, and I don't know where my picture went, um, where you have um, species overlapping in niche. They adapt to not overlap their resource pools. I gave the example of the different finches, or sorry, warblers, um, feeding on different parts of the tree. You know, some feed on the top branches, some feed on the inner branches, some feed on the outer branches. They all live in the same niche. They all could eat anywhere on that tree, but just through evolution, they have they have developed means to not compete by just feeding in certain areas. So they don't overlap on purpose, kind of. And then we talked about character displacement, where competing populations are more divergent um, and are, are, are in adaptive characteristics than non-competing populations. We talked about the example of these two different finches. Um, when found by themselves on their own islands, like Daphne and Los Hermanos, they have very similar beak depths. But when they were found on this one island, when they were competing with each other for food, they evolved to have different beak depths so they would not compete for the same food source. So these are the same species of finch, but found on different islands, their beaks have changed because of character displacement. So that's competition. Now we're going to move on to predation. In predation, one organism benefits, the predator, and the prey obviously doesn't. Um, so predation um, drives many adaptations um, where the predator and the prey will both kind of evolve based on each other. Um, a lot of organisms, oops, sorry, use what's called camouflage and other coloration that confuse predators um, where a predator might not think it's the actual food or might have a hard time finding it. Um, where predators also use camouflage as well to sneak up on their prey. Um, many other organisms use warning coloration to advertise that they're a threat. I mean, you probably all recognize the appearance of a skunk, and you stay away just because of its appearance of its of coloration. And we talked about the coral snake and the king snake have that coloration as well. And then other adaptations are like mimicry, where organisms um, resemble either other organisms, like a harmless species, mimics a harmful species. Like here we have a, a green parrot snake and this hawk moth larva. Looks a lot like a snake. That's actually a moth larva. It's not actually a snake, but it looks like a snake, and so predators will probably leave it alone. And you have um, two or more harmful species with common predators mimic each other, like yellow jackets and bees. They all have a similar coloration, which kind of goes along with coloration as well, that organisms just kind of want to stay away. So that's predation. Then we're going to talk about, a little bit about herbivory. Um, very similar. One benefits, the other does not. Um, one species, the herbivore, eats part of the producer or plant. Um, producers have evolved many adaptations to control this. Um, for example, uh, 
the best example I can think of is, is, is grass and how the growing part of the grass is very low to the ground. So if a herbivore were to chop off the top part of a grass, that plant can still grow. Um, we didn't really talk too much about herbivory, so I'm going to kind of skip over this. We don't need to know what these different types of uh, pods and aphids and so forth because um, that's not going to be anything on the final. The big thing that we talked about was symbiosis. We had three different kinds where two or more species live in close contact with each other. Um, there are three major types of these interactions. We have mutualism, parasitism, and commensalism. In mutualism, um, both organisms benefit. We talked about the acacia tree and these red fire ants. We talked about clownfish and the sea anemone. Everyone wins. Both organisms get a benefit. Um, parasitism, one benefits the parasite. The other does not. Uh, we talked about all different kinds like mosquitoes and mammals. We talked about um, tapeworms and, and other organisms um, of parasitism. And then we have commensalism where one benefits, but the other is not really affected at all. Um, you have the African buffalo and the egret, which the I guess if the egret's eating off the buffalo, you could argue that that's mutualism, but really... The buffalo doesn't really benefit that much from the egret, but birds nesting in trees is also an example of commensalism because the tree does not benefit at all, but the bird does. All right, characteristic or characterizing communities. We have, you know, a big some big terms we learned about in this unit was species richness and relative abundance, where species richness is the number of different species in the area, like community one and community two. In this picture here, community one has definitely more, or actually no, they have the same species richness, but they have different relative abundance, where the proportion of each species in total of the community. So species one and two have different relative abundance, but have the same species richness because they all have five different species living there. And then we talk about the effects of diversity. The major thing we talked about here was what happens if you disturb a community. Uh, some kind of event alters the community structure, removing organisms, changing resource availability. And the big thing we talked about was succession. Um, succession is where you have a sequential change that occurs in a community following a disturbance. Basically, you start with something disturbs the community, and then pioneer organisms come in. You get new communities replacing those that are currently there. Eventually, you come up with what's called the climax community, which is a more of a stable point of the um, community itself. We talked about primary succession, which um, occurs on pre previously uninhabited, uninhabited land where you have no soil. Um, this could be due to glaciers receding, could be due to volcanic eruptions blowing the soil off the area, um, or new island forming in the ocean would all be examples of primary succession. And then we talked about secondary succession, where you know organisms used to live there, um, and the soil is still intact, but for some reason, a forest fire, something destroyed the life there, and then life comes back. And the thing to remember is that secondary succession usually occurs faster because soil is present. You don't have to go through those years of building up nutrient-rich soil. That needs to happen in primary succession. All right, let's switch over and take a look for any questions before we move on to population dynamics. Okay, I don't see any questions, so I'm going to move on. So in population dynamics, basically at the population level, what we're looking at here is, oops, we're looking at um, all organisms of the same species in that area. Um, so I, I'm not sure why I didn't zoom in on there. For, I thought I set the, the flow for it to go to that, zoom in on that population box, but basically all members of the, of the same species in one area um, and how they interact. So that was our major topic there. So how are populations structured and how do populations grow is what we're going to be talking about in this section. We'll kind of apply it to humans as well. Basically to measure population size, um, scientists use often what's called a mark and recapture method. You don't really need to know how that works, but basically it involves uh, marking organisms once they're captured and then letting them go. They're recapturing. There's equations that they use. 
can figure out population size. But basically, what from that they can figure out population size, they can figure out population density, which is important things to know in terms of the health of the population. Another thing that scientists can look at is population distribution. Um, how individuals tend to be distributed in the area, and there are three major patterns. We have clumped. Usually you find clumped distribution around like where resources are kind of in different sections. Um, you have uniform. These are often found in you know, organisms that are very territorial, like these emperor penguins have their you know, specific territory for them themselves, and they'll fight off other males that try to get into their territory, so you find them very uniform, evenly spaced out. And then you have very random um, distribution where they're just, there's no rhyme or reason to how they are spaced out. So how do populations grow? We talked about two different growth models. We talked about exponential growth. Um, and this is where you get you know growth of the population where there's very resources aren't limited. Um, usually this is below what's called the carrying capacity of the environment. So organisms have lots of resources, they reproduce quickly and they live a long time and you get this that, that compounding effect where you get more and more organisms being born over time. But most populations eventually hit what's called the carrying capacity, which gives us what's called logistic growth. And that's where you get the, the S-shaped curve, the leveling out of the population because you've, you've reached your resource limit. Um, and typically, populations will oscillate around the carrying capacity. It's not like they stay steady there. They kind of waver back and forth. And we found that in our predator-prey lab that we did in class. Um, so we talked about how does the environment affect population growth. The main thing we talked about was predator-prey relationship. And the big takeaway from this was that predators have an impact on prey, and then prey also have an impact on the predators. You know, the prey population goes up. That means more food for the predators, and the predator population will go up. But as the predator population goes up, there's more and more mouths to feed. They eat a lot of the prey, which causes the prey population to go down, which then in turn causes the predator population to go down. So we get that fluctuation of predator and prey um, relationship in, in those population numbers. So usually um, these populations fluctuate in a very similar way. But there are other, are, there are other density-dependent population regulation things like competition for resources, predation, just accumulation of waste, territory, um, intrinsic factors like organisms taking care of young and so forth. Um, and then simply disease are all density dependent, which means the dense the population, the more of a factor these will become, the more limiting these factors will become. We also talked about density independent factors like forest fires, earthquakes. They will limit a population size, but it doesn't really matter how big the population is. So it doesn't matter how dense the population is, forest fires will still occur every so often, or droughts will occur every so often. What's interesting is that some density independent factors result in creating density dependent factors because they may limit, for example, a drought may limit food supply, therefore competition goes up. That then is a density dependent limiting factor. All right, we then applied this to human population growth. Um, we talked a little bit about what happens to our human population. We talked about these age structure pyramids. It'd be good to just be able to recognize these, that you know, a rapidly growing country has this definitely this pyramid shape looking age structure graph, whereas a, a slow or no growth, or sorry, no growth country is kind of upside down. You have very few uh, percentage of the population in the pre-reproductive -reprodu years, and then a slow growth, we have more of a column shape and it tapers off at the end. They always taper off at the top because we don't live forever. But the slow growth, you have just about the same number of adults post-reproductive, reproductive, and pre-reproductive is pretty similar. Um, so you get this column-shaped graph. We also talked about a demographic transition model. So you should be able to understand what this graph is showing and understand what's, what's happening to the birth rate and death rate and some reasons why those things are occurring as a country is going from pre-industrial to a post-industrial nation. We also did talk about what is the carrying capacity of the Earth, and we really don't know um, because as the technology improves, we can keep bumping up that carrying capacity, and some people estimate might be reached by 2050, maybe past then. We don't really know what the number is. Some people thought it was 7 billion, and we've obviously surpassed that. Um, so our global carrying capacity is kind of uncertain right now because of what technology may do for us in the future. 
All right, so that was ecology. Do I have any questions on ecology before I move on? Okay, I don't see any questions. You guys kind of got a little quiet here. So I'm going to move on to plants. So our plant unit. Um, so the last unit we covered, um, basically, I'm going to break it down to two things. What do plants need to survive on land, and how do plants reproduce? Those are kind of two major topics we talked about. Um, so what do plants need to survive on land? Well, they need energy, which they get from sunlight. They need gas exchange, which they need oxygen for cell respiration, they need carbon dioxide for photosynthesis, and they need water and minerals, and they need to find ways to limit water loss because they no longer live in water. Um, so they have to be able to absorb it from the, from the soil, that's where the minerals come from as well, and then they have to be able to transport it to the leaves because that's the major photosynthetic organ that allows plants to capture as much light as possible. We then talked about different types of tissue found in plants and how plants have three major tissue layers. We have dermal, which is the outer protective layer, we have vascular tissue, which kind of transports nutrients throughout the plant. And then we have the ground tissue that has various functions, depending on where you find it. For example, ground tissue in a root could be mainly storage, whereas ground tissue in a leaf is going to be mainly photosynthetic. Um, and then we have meristematic tissue, which is where the plant's going to grow from. So those are the major tissues that we've talked about in the plant unit. And then from those tissues, focusing on the vascular tissue, we have some plants that are vascular and some plants that are non-vascular. And that's kind of how plants have evolved to be a dominant organism on land. The vascular plants are probably the most dominant plant because they are able to transport water through xylem and sugar through phloem up and down their plant body. Um, remember, xylem carries water up, phloem carries sugar wherever it needs to go. Um, being able to carry water up especially has allowed plants to grow taller, making them better competitors for one of their main resources, which is sunlight. And so since sunlight is so important for plants, growing taller is an advantage. So having a way of getting water from the ground, the root system, up to the leaves is an advan adaptive advantage. So non-vascular plants aren't that um, common because they lack vascular tissue and therefore can't transport water. So they have to stay low to the ground and can only live in very moist places places where there's always water available because they rely on simple osmosis and diffusion to get stuff to move where they need it to move. So most plants that we think of are actually vascular plants. Now some major structures that we've talked about in our plant unit, we talked about um, we talked about the root structures um, where you have, for example, root hairs, which will help increase surface area for water absorption underground. We have the apical meristem, which is where the plant is going to be growing. That's where active cell division takes place. Um, we have the root cap, which is a protective layer of cells to protect that meristem. And then we have the vascular cylinder, which is this basically all these xylem and phloem cells that help transport water up and transport sugar down into the roots. We then talked about leaf structure. And the leaves, again, the major function is to... Um, photosynthesize. Um, you have the cuticle layer, which is this upper layer. It's not actually made of cells, but it's a waxy coating that protects the cell that's made by the upper epidermal layer of the leaf. Um, you then have the palisade layer, which is, are these column-shaped cells that are filled with chloroplasts for photosynthesis. You then have the spongy layer, which are also photosynthetic, but these cells have gaps in between them, which allows gases like carbon dioxide to fill those empty spaces to allow the palisade layer to get as much CO2 as possible. And then you have the stomata, which are these openings in the underside of the leaf that help with gas exchange. So oxygen can go out and CO2 can go in. Um, those stomata are on the underside because if they're on the top side, the heat of the sun would increase um, water loss. So that's one reason why stomata have evolved to be on the underside of the leaf. But you also have these guard cells that open and close the stomata. If the plant is low in water, it can close its stomata preventing CO2 from getting in, but more importantly, preventing water from getting out. So it's a way plants can maintain homeostasis with their environment is by opening and closing those stomata on the underside of their leaves. And then we talked a lot about plant reproduction, kind of going back to the um, slide I had earlier from um, our last session. Basically, plants use the 
the alternation of generation method of reproducing where you actually have a haploid multicellular organism, which we call the gametophyte, and we have a diploid multicellular organism, which is we call the sporophyte. Um, sometimes they're connected, sometimes they're independent of each other, but very interesting about this is that this is not the way humans work. There is no haploid multicellular organism that's a human. We are all diploid organisms. So plants are very unique in that way. Um, in terms of reproduction, we have spores versus seeds. And basically, this is just how plants disperse their young. How do they get their, their offspring spread far away from them so they're not competing with them for resources? Spore plants release spores as their dispersal mechanism. Spores are unicellular haploid cells, which means the cells themselves have one set of chromosomes, and they will grow into the um, gametophyte organ of the plant or um, organism. Um, but then seed plants are have an adapted advantage in that they use seeds as their dispersal mechanism, which are multicellular structures. Um, the multicellular embryo, so the plants already started to grow, so you already have your diploid sporophyte starting to grow inside the seed, and that's enclosed in a protective covering, and some plants have even gone as far as providing that embryo with some nourishment that allows that seed to stay dormant for a number of years and allow it to grow even if the conditions aren't that favorable. So those are the major differences between spores and seeds. We also talked about the difference between flowers and cones. Now, flowers and cones both produce seeds. Gymnosperms, which are your cone-bearing plants, produce what are called naked seeds. These seeds develop in the cone, but they don't have any fruit surrounding them, so they rely on wind for their dispersal. So that's the gymnosperms, like your pine trees. We then have angiosperms, which are your flowering plants. They develop fruit around their seeds, um, which allow animals to help in dispersal. So they allow animals to carry their seeds far away. Um, basically has helped angiosperms be the most dominant plant on the earth because they have one of the best ways of dispersal. Um, both flowers and cones use pollen um, as the male gametophyte. So if you look back at this diagram, the gametophyte gets so tiny, it's microscopic and be carried can be carried by wind or by other animals. And no longer requires the need for water to allow that sperm cell to swim to the egg. Um, so the pollen grain has helped both gymnosperms and angiosperms to be the major kinds of plants, the most successful kinds of plants on the planet. I went over that all already. And then we talked about the flower. So this would get to whoever asked the question about the flower. Um, we're talking about flowering plants in particular. We're talking about what the flower is, and then we're talking about pollination versus fertilization. So major parts of the flower. So we have the male structure, which is, again is the stamen. Um, the stamen has two parts, the anther, which actually produces the pollen, and the filament, which basically just holds up the anther. So that's the male reproductive structure, structure of the flower. We then talk, then the female structure, which is sometimes called the carpal, other times called the pistil. Those are going to be kind of used interchangeably for our purposes. You have the stigma, style, and ovary. The stigma collects the pollen. Sorry about my misspelling there. So it collects pollen, and the style basically holds that stigma up so the pollen can be easily collected. And then the ovary is the structure right down here, which contains the eggs and protects the eggs, um, which is the, probably the most important part of the flower. Other parts of the flower we have um, are the petals, which basically just attract pollinators. And we have sepals. Uh, we did talk about perfect flowers and imperfect flowers, complete flowers and incomplete flowers. So you should know those terms. Like a perfect flower has both male and female parts, whereas a complete flower has all four parts. Um, so those are important terms to know. And then we talked about pollination versus fertilization. So pollination, all that really is, is we transfer pollen from the anther of either the same flower, if it's self-pollination, or another flower of the same species, if it's cross-pollination, we transfer pollen to the stigma. Once that pollen grain lands there, it grows what's called a pollen tube down into the ovary, and that's what delivers the sperm cells. So the pollen grain actually is two cells. One cell grows that tube down to the ovary, and then the cells inside that are the sperm cells. They actually divide, and you get two sperm cells as a result, which results in what's called double fertilization. So my arrows got mixed up here. Um, double fertilization, basically, um, very unique to the flowering plant world, where... Um, the first sperm cell will fertilize the egg, which will turn into the plant embryo. 
but the second sperm cell fertilizes these two nuclei that sit in the ovule, and that will result in the endosperm, which is going to be food for that embryo. When you think of eating like a peanut or any kind of bean, the nutritional value you get from that is actually the endosperm that was made there for the embryo if that seed were to be planted. So that's our plants. Went over that kind of quickly, but it's the most recent stuff, so you should be familiar with it. Um, do you, any of you have questions on plants? Any questions on plants? Are the questions still working? I can I don't I haven't seen a question pop up in a while. Well, I'm hoping they're working. If they're not, I will go to the Google Docs and I will look at those once we're done. I'm gonna talk about animals and we will be done with this review. All right, some people just asked questions. So it looks like it is working. So I'm glad it's still working. You guys just are so enthralled with this Prezi. You have no questions. Maybe my review is just that awesome. All right, so last thing I want to talk about is the animal unit. So all I'm going to say about the animal unit for you guys is I recommend reviewing those animal terms. Do you need to watch this video again? No, but it wouldn't hurt if you're confused on some of those terms. Maybe fast forward to certain parts to get through those terms or look at your term sheet that you guys filled out. Just know what those terms mean. So that, that video I made would be very helpful for that. And then another main thing is just look for different trends in the organ system. So I posted these on our website, but they're also here in this Prezi. Um, just how the animal systems have changed throughout evolutionary history, from the simplest animal, which is the sponge, to the most complex animal like us, which is a mammal. Um, some trends to notice, if you look at as far as like the digestive system, you move from a filter feeder in the sponges to this gastrovascular cavity in um, the darians to a two opening system in, in the roundworms and segmented worms to a complete digestive tract like us where you have an uh, intake mouth and an exit for waste which is called the anus and you get these organs that develop in between for storage and digestion. So as you move up the animal systems or the animal kingdoms, or sorry, not kingdoms, phylums, you see a more complex digestive tract develop. Same can be said for circulation, how they're really started with no system, and then you get like this, um, this kind of water vascular system in the echinoderms, um, and then you get this open system in the mollusks and the arthropods where you're pumping fluid around the organ, but there's no blood vessels, and then you get the... Um, fish and the reptiles and the amphibians and birds and mammals that eat this closed system where you start developing a more sophisticated two-chambered heart than three-chambered heart than like in mammals and birds, a very efficient four-chambered heart for a complete separation of oxygen-rich and oxygen-poor blood. Um, and that ties in very closely with respiration where you get from simple diffusion to special tubes and so forth to get CO2 out and O2 in, but then you get a respiratory tract or like aquatic organisms get these things called gills. Terrestrial animals get things called lungs, which allow for more efficient respiration exchange of gases. Um, and then water balance and excretion. Um, you basically just, again, go from diffusion to more sophisticated systems like nephridia, and then really sophisticated things like a kidney. Um, and then reproduction, you rely mostly on water, where the sperm has to swim to the egg, very similar to plants. Um, so sponges, nadarians, flatworms get really interesting where you get the the hermaphroditic organs where you the winner gets to be the dad, the loser gets to be the mom. Um, then you start getting things like internal fertilization where the egg actually swims to this or the sperm swims to the egg inside the the female organism. Um, so you get that really well or more developed reproductive system um, as you move up in the animal groups. So you can go can look through these. And then finally, we talked about nervous system, where you go from very simple to very complex, like the sponges, for example, are more local reaction. They react to, you know, you touch a sponge in the left side, the right side's not going to know, whereas you get nadarians that can react to touch and start feeding. You get flatworms that develop an eye spot that detect light, and they can actually go after food. You get your first kind of hunters. But then these nerves become more and more sophisticated and start collecting. You get these ganglia. 
Um, and as you get more and more sophisticated nerve systems, you get more and more sophistication in what the organism can do. What's really interesting is that you have this group of mollusks, the cephalopods, which are your squid and your octopi, that are very complex, very advanced, if not as advanced as us. We have brains and complex eyes, can sense chemicals. Um, but basically, you get more and more sensory input, the more the organism can do in finding food and finding resources. Um, and so I would just look over these trends and see kind of how things get more sophisticated as you go up in the higher organisms in our animal unit. All right, so that is it. That is a lot of stuff. Um, so let me switch over to the Google Docs. Let me see if any questions have been popped up here. Let me go to the one on bacteria and viruses first um, and answer these questions. So what are the two main styles of action of the specific immune response. Okay, so we did talk about the humoral response, which involves antibodies, go after active pathogens. That's the humoral response. And then you have the um, cell mediated response, which goes after, so that's your cytotoxic T cells that go after infected cells. Okay, so we kind of talked about that. Um, what, would, what would you use the cell immune response and when would you use the humoral immune response? Both are used at the same time. If you get infected with a virus or a bacteria, both responses occur. Um, so they're, they're, they're both occurring. So it's like two, two ways of fighting the war against viruses. You have your Air Force and you have your Navy. They're both going after the same bad guys, just in different ways. Okay, moving over to the um, document that was meant for today. So just, I just talked about the evolutionary advancements in animals. So we talked about gastrovascular cavities to the elementary canal. So talking about re uh, respiration, talking about reproduction, and talking about the nervous system and how those get more sophisticated you move up in the animal groups. Um, what would be post-industrial population graph look like? It would be the no growth or declining growth where you have very, be basically almost like upside down pyramid um, shape. It wouldn't really be a pyramid. It'd be narrow at the bottom, narrow at the top, kind of fat in the middle as far as post-industrial growth. And then I kind of put a comment here already. This was on the study review guide, but we're not covering hormones, movement, or seasonal responses in our plant units, so we didn't get to that, and that will not show up on the final. Okay, questions. Where is the chart that has the systems in, of animals? I will put that on the website. Um, so, so Jack just asked this question. The chart that has the systems of the animals, I thought those were on the website. If they're not, I will put them up there once I am done with this review session. Okay, are there any other questions you guys have before I sign off? I will be seeing third hour and I'll be seeing sixth hour tomorrow. Seventh hour, you're off the hook until Wednesday. Any questions? Any questions? All right, well, I hope you guys had a good Memorial Day weekend. I hope you are rested. I hope you get some good sleep tonight. If you feel like you're, you're done studying, I would recommend going to bed within the next half hour or so. One of the most important things to do to, to do well in your finals tomorrow is to get a good night's sleep because if you stay up studying and don't get enough REM sleep, all the stuff you just learned through this review session will not stick in your brain. So if I can make any recommendation to you guys tonight is go to bed earlier. If you want to study some more, wake up earlier and study before the test. Don't stay up till 2 a.m. tonight studying. Also, remember tomorrow, eat a good breakfast. Um, bring a snack to the, re to, the, to the final with you and bring some water to drink um, and your charged Chromebook because you will be taking this on the Chromebooks um, tomorrow in class. So there's no other questions. Thanks for participating in this review session. I hoped it helped. Um, I'll probably be passing out, uh, sending out a survey through Google Classroom in a few minutes. So if you want to fill out that survey for me, it would be greatly appreciated. I will see most of you tomorrow. Have a good night.